رسول الكريم وعلى اله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنتي الى يوم الدين او praise due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on the last prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم and on all those who follow the path of righteousness until the last day as brother announced the topic the importance of following the middle course last of ahli sunnah wal jamaa in relationship to the salafi movement the most important aspect of it is following that middle course following the middle path which comes from a description given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the believers in surah al-baqarah verse 143 in which Allah says there وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطًا لِتَكُونُوا شُهَدَاءً عَلَى النَّاسِ وَيَكُونَ الرَّسُولُ عَلَيْكُمْ شَهِيدًا Thus, I have made you a justly balanced nation to be witnesses for the nations and the messenger a witness for you. أُمَّةٌ وَسَطٌ This is the description which Allah has given the nation or community of believers a justly balanced community which is neither to one extreme nor to the other in surah al-isra verse 29 allah says wala taj'al yadaka مغلولة إلى عنقك ولا تبسطها كل البسط فتقعد ملوما محصورا Do not chain your hand to your neck like a miser nor open it completely and sit blamed and poor In terms of charity and giving Allah instructs us not to go to either extreme either the extreme of being so miserly as we would refer to as tight-fisted that you give nothing nor to the other extreme of giving everything and then later regretting it in a state of abject poverty and in Surah Al-Furqan Allah describes the believers الذين إذا أنفقوا لم يصرفوا ولم يقتروا وكان بين ذلك قواما those neither extravagant or miserly when they spend but instead are firmly between those two extremes so in all of the affairs of the believing community there should be a balance there should not be an extreme to one or the other with regards to material possessions which Allah has given us we have a responsibility to use it in a balanced and sensible way though it is common some groups will commonly give us the example of Abu Bakr when the Prophet وسلم, called for commitment by the believers to give of their wealth for the sake of jihad fighting in defense of Islam in promotion of Islam Abu Bakr gave all of his wealth and when he was asked what did he leave family he said he left them Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and this is oftentimes brought to us by some groups as being the ideal that we should be prepared to do at any time and we may be invited to go out 
for 40 days or for four months or whatever and we not, may not be in a position to look after our families but then we are cited this example of Abu Bakr and told we must get out and go out to propagate Islam however when we look into the Sunnah we find that this was a unique example this was a desperate circumstance in which the Muslim community was threatened so at this time it required extreme uh, effort to deal with that potential harm to the community as a whole under other circumstances we find other companions of the Prophet may God peace and bless be upon him offering to give away all their wealth and he told them not to do so offering to give away half their wealth which Omar had done when Abu Bakr gave all Omar gave half and he told them not to told him not to do so and he had to, he, he, then he suggested a third and the Prophet ﷺ said okay a third but even a third is plenty that it is better for you to leave your family taken care of than to leave them after you have died begging people so from that we understand that Islam does not want us to go to extremes to the point where we leave behind our family you know people who we are responsible for incapable of taking care of themselves <coughs> now that's with reg regards to material possessions in general with regards to the religion excess excessiveness in religion is particularly abhorrent is particularly disliked by God and by the prophets of God we find Allah saying in the Quran قُلْ يَا أَهْلَ الْكِتَابِ لَا تَغْلُوا فِي دِينِكُمْ غَيْرَ الْحَقِّ say O people of the scripture do not exceed the bounds of what is proper in your religion by believing in falsehood Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said beware of excessiveness in religion for surely those before you perished due to excessiveness this is recorded by Nasai and Ibn Majah and during the farewell pilgrimage the Prophet asked Ibn Abbas sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he asked Ibn Abbas to collect some pebbles this is for the rites of stoning, Rami. This is part of the rites of Hajj. He asked Ibn Abbas to collect some pebbles for him. And when Ibn Abbas collected the pebbles and brought them, they were small pebbles, he approved the choice of Ibn Abbas, small pebbles, saying, yes, stoning should be with stones similar to these. Beware of excessiveness in the religion. This is also narrated by Nasai and Ahmed. The significance of this, when we look in terms of practice of Muslims today, those of us who have gone and made Hajj, you will find in the rite of Rami, which should involve, as he said, small pebbles, no bigger than a joint of a finger, people are throwing sticks shoes even they've gone to excesses you even have some people climbing on the jamarat and beating it with their shoes you know, this is something uh, those of you who have gone to make uh, Umrah Hajj have observed I'm sure with your own eyes so this teaching of the Prophet ﷺ has been lost on many of the masses of Muslims today and Allah knowing the danger of excessive love of the Prophet warned the people having the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu say in Surah Al-Kahf verse 110 قُلْ إِنَّمَا أَنَا بَشَرٌ مِثْلُكُمْ يُوحَى إِلَيَّ أَنَّمَا إِلَاهُكُمْ إِلَاهٌ وَاحِدٌ say Muhammad to the people 
I am only a man like yourselves to whom it has been revealed that your God is one God emphasizing the humanity of the Prophet why? because of the deviation, the excesses which those before had gone to in terms of expressing their love for the Prophet's prior and Prophet Muhammad himself in a hadith narrated by Ibn Omar he quotes the Prophet Muhammad as saying لا تتروني كما أطرطت النصار ابن مريم فإنما أنا عبد فقولوا عبد الله ورسوله this is found in Sahih Bukhari do not exaggerate in praising me as the Christians did to the son of Mary for I am only a slave so call me the slave of Allah and his messenger the excesses which the Christians went to in elevating Prophet Jesus from that of a Prophet of God and a human being to that of God Himself is a serious deviation that excess took them on a path to hell because they now direct their worship to Jesus instead of God and this is the greatest crime, the greatest sin that any human being can commit is to worship other than God as Allah said in the Quran that He would forgive any sin that He wishes except for shirk worshipping others besides God this is the one unforgivable sin meaning if a person dies in that state of worshipping other than God or others along with God then one dies going to hell other sins that one may do in this life God may forgive them if he wishes their good deeds can wipe out evil deeds but no good deed can wipe out the greatest evil of worshipping others instead of Allah because that is the denial of our very purpose of existence as Allah told us in the Quran وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I didn't create the jinn and mankind except for my worship our purpose is to worship God so to worship other than God is to deny the very purpose for which we were created therefore the excesses in religion which took place with those in the nations before the time of the final message of Islam to mankind took them to a point of disbelief and we can find unfortunately among ignorant Muslims a number of myths and uh, stories which have been spun and woven about Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu which elevate him beyond his status also we can find in many of the books that speak about the birth of the Prophet in his seerah they talk about the fact that when he was when, he was be, when his mother was giving birth to him that the light in the temples of the fire worshippers went out and that the pillars in the temples of the Christians and the Romans shook and a variety of other myths concerning his birth to give it you know some kind of uh, miraculous character and these stories are not true stories we also find traditions which have been attributed to Prophet Muhammad saying that he was created from the light of Allah so you have what is known as the Muhammadan light and Nur and Muhammadi right which is false lies or they have traditions in which they claim Hadith Qudsi that Allah said as quoted by Prophet Muhammad were it not for you O Muhammad I would not have created this world all of these are lies falsehoods apocryphal tales which are in no way true regarding the Prophet may God's peace and blessing be upon him and those who narrate it are in fact in sin 
because Prophet Muhammad may God peace and blessings be upon him said whoever lies in my name man kazzaba alayya muta'amidan falyatabawwa miqadahu minan nar whoever lies in my name will find his seating place in the hellfire so the reality is Prophet Muhammad may God peace and blessings be upon him was a man like the prophets before him what distinguished him as with the prophets before him from the rest of mankind was revelation God revealed the final word to him and from him to the rest of mankind his life was exemplary as were the lives of the prophets before him because they were chosen by God the stories that are told in the Old Testament about the prophets of God committing incest and drunkenness and adultery and all kinds of corruption these are lies the Quran clarifies that the Jews told lies about the prophets as they killed them they lied about them but the fact of the matter is that Prophet Muhammad may God's peace and blessings be upon him was born in a pagan environment his father and mother died as pagans many Muslims believe that his father and mother are in paradise and they even have a home in Mecca which they claim is the home of the Prophet and they go there as part of their rites of pilgrimage but it's all false the place is not known and it's lies because it's clearly indicated in Sahih Muslim that the Prophet's father is in hell a man came to Prophet Muhammad and asked him where is my father and the Prophet said your father is in hell the man turned away you know tears came to his eyes he turned away and the Prophet called him back and he said he's with my father and we have in Surah Tawbah in verse 80 and 84 Allah prohibiting Prophet Muhammad for asking for forgiveness for his mother because she died in disbelief and also in Sahih Muslim there is narration indicating where Prophet Muhammad said that I went to the grave of my mother and I asked Allah's permission to ask forgiveness for her and Allah refused me why? why would Allah refuse him? because his mother died as a pagan as the parents of Prophet Abraham and other prophets died as pagans yeah. it's not necessary for us to to make up stories about the Prophet to try to make him special no the fact that his parents died as pagans doesn't diminish his stature that is not his responsibility his responsibility was to live an exemplary life as he did and to convey the word of God which came to him now he is is a basic principle of the Sharia as we have the extremes which have been forbidden both in the material world as well as in the spiritual plane excesses are forbid forbidden going to one excess or to the other the principle of ease is a basic principle in the Sharia meaning Allah says after talking about fasting and how fasting is compulsory for those who see the moon and then Allah goes on to say that those who are ill and those who are traveling they are excused from fasting and may make up those days after their journey then Allah says يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ بِكُمُ الْيُسْرَ وَلَا يُرِيدُ بِكُمُ الْعُسْرَ Allah wishes ease for you and He doesn't wish difficulty for you we also find after Allah talks about making ablution for prayers if a person finds himself or herself in a sick situation where no water is available what to do? ablution involves making water then Allah gave the option of tayammum that is making ablution with dry sand and then Allah said ما يريد الله ليجعل عليكم من حرج Allah does not want to place you in difficulty on the basis of this the scholars have concluded that the foundation of the Sharia is promoting ease and Prophet Muhammad practice confirmed it he, 
he was described by Aisha that whenever he had the choice between two halal acts he would choose the easiest of the two whenever he had the choice he would choose the easiest one if they were both halal as long as there's no sin involved he would choose the easier one and of course Allah told, it, told us لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةً حَسَنًا that there is in the Messenger of Allah for you the best of examples so this is the better way to choose that which is easier on one occasion when he was going for Hajj he saw a man being carried, this is a Muslim, being carried between two other men they were carrying him, he sort of stumbling along walking along and the Prophet he was an old man, asked what's wrong with this man, what's his problem, why is he in this state they said that he made an oath to walk to Hajj, walk through the whole of the Hajj he made an oath and Prophet said that Allah doesn't need this from him you know, told the man to break his oath you know, do the compensation for it and ride or take an easier path also there was a particular circumstance in Medina when Prophet Muhammad was sitting in the masjid with his companions then a Bedouin walked into the masjid he went over to the corner of the masjid stooped down and began to urinate now, of course when he started to do it the companions rushed to grab this man and throw him out of the masjid this is defiling the masjid but the Prophet وسلم, said to the Sahaba stop, leave him alone leave him alone, let him finish when he's finished, take a bucket of water and pour it in the place where he urinated and then he said you have been sent to make things easy and not to make them difficult this was his instruction to his companions afterwards he called the Bedouin over and he told him, listen this place of worship is not a suitable place for you to do these things when he finished, he instructed him this was the way that the Prophet dealt with these kind of circumstances why? because had they rushed over to grab him in the midst of, you know, urinating then he probably would have splattered his urine all over them they would have created a worse circumstance instead of being confined to one little area where he was urinating it would have been all over the area of the masjid it would have been splattered on them as they were trying to drag him out of there etc so rather than you know, make things more difficult and more complicated let the man finish and then instruct him what to do we also find when Mu'az ibn Jabal and Abu Musa al-Ash'ari were sent to Yemen Mu'az being sent as the governor he told them yassiru wa la tu'assiru make things easy for the people don't make it difficult obey each other and do not differ among yourselves as recorded by Bukhari Muslim as the Amir or the governor his, his responsibility in calling people to Islam establishing Islam in that region it was to be done in a fashion which was not going to turn the people off from religion drive them away from religion it was supposed to be done in a moderate and attractive way we have also the example of Mu'ad ibn Jabal before this when he used to pray with his people he used to go and pray Isha with his people after praying with Prophet ﷺ, he would go over to the place where the, his tribe was and he would lead them in prayer but during the prayer he decided to pray the whole of Surah Al-Baqarah in the first rakah you know Prophet Muhammad did that with his companions on some occasion here Mu'az is now praying the whole of Surah Al-Baqarah with these people now some of the people standing behind him it became so difficult for them they just backed out of the prayer they abandoned the prayer at the end of the prayer you know Mu'adh was upset these people left the prayer so he took them back to the Prophet Muhammad and you know for the Prophet to وسلم, to scold them but instead the Prophet scolded Mu'adh he said Afatanun anta ya Mu'adh 
Are you putting the people on trial, O Muad? You know, you're making fitna for them, making difficulty for them. And he said, another occasion, relating to the same thing, he said, some of you make people dislike good deeds, referring to the Salah. So whoever amongst you leads people in prayer should shorten it. Because among you, or among them, are weak and old people and those with business to attend to. So as not to create a fitna for the people, they are instructed to, as those leading the prayers are instructed to shorten the prayers. We have also the statement of Prophet Muhammad Sallam, Ad-Din Yusuf, the religion is easy. And whoever overburdens himself will not be able to continue that way. Since Sahih Bukhari, the religion is easy. If you take it moderately, it is easy. But if you overburden yourself with it, then you will do it for a while, then you're going to run out of steam and stop doing it. Aisha quoted the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu as saying, Do those deeds which you can do easily, as Allah will not tire of giving reward until you get tired of doing good. And the most beloved deed to Allah is the one done regularly, even if it is few. Better to do a few things which are enjoined on us regularly then try to do all one time for one week and then we're not doing it for three weeks of course this is not referring to the basics right the basic five pillars we're not talking about those we're talking about things beyond the five pillars additional acts of righteousness that we don't try to take on too much which is beyond our capacity, better to take on a little bit. Each day or each week we try to start a new practice in our lives, correct something in our lives and try to get that established. Then build on it gradually, increasing the quality of our practice of Islam. Ibn Omar was so absorbed in worship that he neglected his wife. Word got to Prophet Muhammad Sallam about it. So he called Abdullah ibn Omar and he said, Oh Abdullah, I have been informed that you fast days and stay up nights in prayer. Ibn Omar said yes. So he said, Do not do that. Fast a few days and break fast for a few. Pray some nights and rest others. Your body has a right over you. Your wife has a right over you and your guest has a right over you. Recorded by Al-Bukhari. The tendency, I mean, we want to be better Muslims, to increase our acts of righteousness, etc. But we don't want to go to an extreme where we actually neglect our responsibilities to our families and to ourselves, looking after ourselves. And there's a well-known uh, tradition also recorded in Bukhari that three people had come to the wives of the Prophet وسلم, and asked them about the quality of the Prophet's worship and when they described to him what he used to do the three of them said well you know the Prophet is the Prophet of Allah Allah has forgiven his sins we need to do more than this so one of them swore that he wouldn't sleep anymore at night he would pray all night long Another one swore that he was going to fast every day for the rest of his life. The third one swore he was never going to get married. Because women distract you from worship. Okay? When Prophet Muhammad came and he heard this, he called the three of them. And he called the people and he said, I am the best of you. I am the best of you. But I sleep at night and I pray at night. I fast some days and I break fast some days. And I marry. Then he said, فَمَنْ رَغِبَ عَنْ سُنَّتِي فَلَيْسَ مِنِّي And whoever loves or prefers a sunnah, a way, other than my way, is not a true follower of mine. Ma- 
There is another incident in Medina. Prophet Muhammad Sallam had made Salman al farisi the brother of Abu Darda, another companion. They were made brothers when the Muhajirun and the Ansar created that first community in Medina. The Ansar, those who were living in Medina from the local tribes, the Muhajirun, those who made Hijra or emigrated from Mecca, he would take one person from the Muhajirun, he would take one person from the Ansar, and he would make them brothers. He would make them brothers to the point where they would inherit from each other and everything. Later Allah cancelled it. But initially, to create that bond, he did this. <coughs> and Salman went to visit Abu Darda. Salman is the Muhajir, the emigrant. Abu Darda is from the people of Medina. So Salman went to his house and he found that Umm al Darda was dressed shabbily, you know, in rags, virtually. So he asked her, you know, what's the problem? And she said, your brother Abu Darda is not interested in this world. So Salman then sat with Abu Darda for a meal. And he found Abu Darda didn't want to eat, said he was fasting. So Salman told him, I'm not going to eat unless you eat. So he made him break his fast. And then the three nights that he stayed in the house with him, every time Abu Darda would get up to pray at night, he would make him go back to sleep until the morning. They got up and did the morning prayer together. Afterwards, he said to Abu Darda, your Lord has a right on you. Your soul has a right on you. And your family has a right. So give each their due. This was his advice to his brother. Abu Darda went back to Prophet Muhammad Sallam and asked him. You know, he was in doubt. I mean, he heard what Salman had said, but he still felt somehow that what he was doing was better. So he asked the Prophet Sallam, and what was his opinion of what Salman had said. And, Salma, and the Prophet Muhammad Sallam said, Salman spoke the truth. So, from these incidences in the time of Prophet Muhammad Sallam, we can see that the Sunnah emphasized moderation, not going to excesses in religious practices and matters. Because excessiveness is against the nature of the community. It becomes oppressive. It may be a part of the nature of the individual who newly comes into the community. He feels very enthusiastic, he wants to try to do everything, and he wants everybody to do everything too. This is a, a natural phenomenon that we see occurring time and time again. But the fact of the matter is that it is something which needs to be tempered. Because ultimately that enthusiasm, that excessive practice, becomes short-lived. The person does it for a while, six months, eight months, one year, and then you see them. Maybe they hardly doing anything of Islam after that. Also, excessiveness and inviting people to excessiveness, it denies the rights of others to live in a more not moderate uh, state in terms of their practice of Islam. So, when we are going to judge what is excessiveness and what is not, what is extremism, etc., we have to take into account different factors because both piety and environment may affect the judgment of what constitutes extremism and what does not. For example, among those whose practice of Islam may be lax, for example, women, wearing proper hijab or niqab, this may be considered extreme. 
you know, where women are not covering themselves properly, wearing the hijab may be considered extreme. You know, where the norm is for people just to wear a little thing tied on their head, the woman who wears the full scarf that comes and covers her bosom area, big size, etc., is considered extreme. But in fact, it isn't. Also, you may find, for example, the practices of, for example, what was known as the Wahhabi movement, which started in Saudi Arabia and Arabia in the 19th century. Right? It was a reformist movement to try to bring people back to the proper practice of Islam. That the people who followed in this trend of the movement later on in the 20th century when they gained power, from a religious point of view, they were still following the concepts that were introduced by Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. Politically, they set their own program. But from a religious point of view, they leveled all the graves in the graveyard. When they went to the graveyards of Mecca and Medina, which at that time looked like cities. There were huge structures built over the graves, looking like mosques and big domes and all this kind of thing. And they leveled them flat to the ground. The Muslim world, which had been used to graveyards with structures built over them, mausoleums, etc., they considered this extremism, some kind of apostasy. When they banned intercession, praying to Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, which was common practice in many parts of the Muslim world then, they thought this is extremism, how can they say this? When they also banned the practices of what came to be known as Sufism at that time, mysticism, you know, which involved all kinds of wild practices, spinning and jumping and all kinds of things which people were calling remembrance of Allah. And they said, no, it's not remembrance of Allah. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu never did it. His companions never did this thing. This is something invented by you people. Stop it. They considered this extremist. They also considered the fact that they, that movement forbade the celebration of the Prophet's birthday. It's a standard around the Muslim world. Celebrating the Prophet's birthday. Like Christians celebrate Christmas, Muslims are celebrating the birthday of the Prophet. Milad and Nabi. So their banning it was, was considered to be extremism. But the fact of the matter, why? Because the environment, that the state of the Muslim world at the time had so deviated from true Islam that when somebody was calling back for true Islam, it appeared extreme and deviant to them. <coughs> so, these are among the factors when we are going to try to identify what may be extreme or what may be deviant. We have to be aware of the uh, people involved who are making this claim or about whom we are going to make statements. We also have to be aware of the environment, what is the political, social circumstances in which uh, these kind of rulings would be made. Also, we have to recognize human fallibility. That is, that sins don't cancel Iman, basic principle. Sins don't cancel Iman. There's a tendency that once somebody makes a mistake or whatever, you know, then this person becomes ostracized, this person becomes labeled, you know, that they no longer are of any consequence in the community. This is an extreme view because human beings are fallible. In one occasion, we have to consider a companion of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, asked permission of the Prophet to fornicate. Yes. He was coming into Islam and he, he said he would come into Islam but he wanted permission to fornicate. Now, the Prophet, may God's peace and blessed be upon him, didn't tell him, no, get out of here, you know, what is this, you know, you want to accept Islam and fornicate, <laughs> get out of here, man, you're not serious. No, he said, come, 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 come and accept Islam. And then he explained to him, let him accept Islam first because he believed in Allah and the Messenger and so on, so let him accept Islam. Then he explained to him, said, uh, you know, would you approve of somebody fornicating with your mother? Or your sister? Or your daughter? You know? Or your aunt? And of course the man said no. 
possible? You're asking permission to fornicate. Who do you think you're going to fornicate with? It's got to be somebody's mother, or their sister, or their aunt, or their daughter. The man was convinced and dropped it. This is the way of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We also have to, in, a, in any given community, we have to have certain respect for the elders of the community. Those who are learned and those who have experience from having been in the community for some period of time. Even if they become lax, because they're human beings. There may be times when they commit certain errors, etc. And we should not destroy then our respect for them simply because they committed an error, two errors, something like that. I mean, if they become corrupt, this is a whole other situation. We're talking about a situation where they become corrupt and they are now, you know, defaming Islam. No. We're talking about a situation where a human being, one of the elders of the community, etc., commits an error. We should still maintain that respect. Why? Because Prophet Muhammad had said, whoever doesn't respect our elders, have mercy on our children and recognize the rights of our scholars, is not of us. This is recorded by Ahmed and Al-Hakim. And we have a particular incident which took place in the time of Prophet Muhammad in which Hatib ibn Abi Balta'a sent a message to the Quraysh requesting protection for his children and relatives in Mecca in exchange for information about the Muslims' battle strategy. This was that in, in, in effect an act of treachery. That message that he sent was intercepted. He was one of the companions of the Prophet who did this. The message was intercepted. When Omar radiallahu anhu found out, he immediately jumped up and said that he would go and cut that guy's head off. Take his head off right away. Prophet Muhammad stopped him. You know, stopped him. And he said, Perhaps Allah has looked at those who took part in the battle of Bakr and said, Do as you please, for I have forgiven you. This Hafid was one of those who took part in the battle of Badr along with the Prophet Wasallam. This was an error on his part. But that commitment that he had made earlier, you know, that commitment to Islam was such that respect still had to be given to it even though he committed an error here out of weakness. He had children and relatives in Mecca who were under the Quraysh who could harm them seriously and were harming them. So in his desire to try to save his family, he was leaking out some of the strategy, battle strategy of the Muslims. It's an error. His weakness, his love for his family had led him to that. And this is the danger of love. That sometimes the love of family can lead us to sin. This is why Allah tells us in the Quran that your wives and your children are a fitna, a trial for you. So beware. Because your love of them, not that they are themselves fitna, but your love for them can lead you into sin. So, the basic principle here in terms of community and maintaining the moderate stance is that we should strive to practice Islam, the fundamental principles of Islam, to the utmost of our abilities. And the additional acts of worship, the voluntary acts, we should try to do as much of them as we can. But not to overload ourselves to the point where we can't handle it. That the best approach to it is to do differences to split the ranks. There are human beings and there was a level of tolerance amongst them which allowed them to work together, to stay as a community. And these are the type of lessons that we need to learn when we look back into the Sunnah, the Sirah. Now, 
we have Yarhamullah. We have historically a, a, a tradition of divisions which have taken place among the community. Allah said, Mankind were one single community, and Allah sent prophets with glad tidings and warnings. And with them He sent the scripture in truth to judge between people in matters wherein they differed. But the people to whom the scripture were given after the clear truth had come to them differed only because of hatred one to another. Then by Allah His grace guided the believers to the truth concerning that wherein they differed. And Allah guides whom He will to the straight path. So from the most ancient of times divisions appeared among the communities of the believers. Prophets would come, clarify the truth, and those who went to the truth formed one body. Those who were preferred to stay with the ancient traditions, etc., they formed another body. Now, Prophet Muhammad told us that the Jews divided into 71 sects one in heaven and 70 in hell. The Christians parted into 72 sects one in heaven and one in hell and 71 in hell by the one in whose hands is my soul my ummah my nation will separate into 73 sects one in heaven and 72 in hell the companion narrated it said O Messenger of Allah which one is the saved sect he said the jama'ah the community and in another narration he said this community will divide into 73 sects all of them will go to hell except one and there are those following what I and my companions practice so we know that there is ultimately one body one group that represents those who will attain salvation headed for paradise and the rest are headed for hell we also know that there will always be some who follow this path. The important thing is to know who represents this group, the Jama'ah. Are they particular organizations, political type organizations which label themselves by different names? Or do they represent an ideology, concepts, or principles? What we find is that Allah says in the Quran, وَمَنْ يُشَاقِكَ الرَّسُولِ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُ الْهُدَىٰ وَيَتَّبِعْ غَيْرَ سَبِيلِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ نُوَلِّهِ مَا تَوَلَّى وَنُسْلِهِ جَهَنَّمْ وَسَاءَتْ مَصِيرًا Whoever opposes the messenger after the right path has been clearly shown to him and follows a way other than that of the believers, I will keep him in his chosen path and burn him in hell. What an evil end. Whoever chooses a way other than that of the believers. The way of the believers is referred to as the Jama'ah. On the basis of this, a term began to be used after the time of Prophet Muhammad Sallam, Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, the people who follow the Sunnah and the community of believers. They represent or represented the saved sect. Meaning, the two principles that they follow were what? That they follow the Sunnah. They give precedence to the Sunnah and they follow the way which is agreed upon by the main community of believers particularly that community in the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi his companions because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said Khairun Nasi Qarni the best of generations or people is my generation Thumma Ladina Yalunahum Thumma Ladina Yalunahum then those who follow them then those who follow them 
So he stressed that when we are to look at the community of believers who they are, those first three generations are the best example of what represents the practices and understandings of that community of believers. Now, this term, Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, which is also shortened down to Sunni Muslims, was used to distinguish the main body of Islam from the sects which broke off from it. The first of which we spoke about earlier, the Khawarij. And the second sect which broke off from mainstream Islam were the Shia. The Shia who formed ultimately their own religion. They began as a political difference but this difference evolved in time into another religion. I know some people think that the Shia are just another madhab. Talk about schools of Islamic law. You have the Hanafi, the Shafi, the Maliki, the Hanbali, and the Jafari. They say, and the Jafari. You know, it's just another school of Islamic law. But the fact of the matter is, it is not just another school of Islamic law. The Shia represent another religion. There are some extreme groups among them which no one doubts is not another religion. For example, you have the Nusairis, the Nusairis of Syria, Hafiz Asad, is the head of this particular clan. Small, but they are the rulers of Syria. Right, the majority of Muslims in Syria are Sunni Muslims, but the small clan rules the whole country. They control the military, you know, the, the, uh, the armored wing of the military, the air force. The foot soldiers are all Sunnis. But the armored wing, this is the Nusairis. They're also known as the Alawis. Now their belief is that Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ali, Radiallahu Anhu, and Salman, Radiallahu Anhu, were all manifestations of Allah. This is their belief. This is another religion. This is not Islam. In Islam we have no manifestations of Allah, that Allah becomes a human being. No. This is totally out of Islam. Allah does not become and never became and never will be a human being. Allah, God is God. And His creation, human beings are his creation. They cannot become the creator, nor does the creator become his creation. This is basic Islam trace. So anyone who holds other than that, it's outside of Islam, not a religion. Another group known as the Ismailis, for example, the Ismailis, the Aga Khan is among them, where you have this individual Aga Khan, who right now he is the UN representative for refugees or something like this, you know. I mean, he's a big figure uh, in the world political scene, the UN. Quite wealthy. Now his followers amongst the Ismailis, the main group of Ismailis, they believe that he is God incarnate. They believe that he is God incarnate. This is their belief. So, can we accept them as Muslims? No. Oh, it's not a religion. Another religion altogether. Just as someone, for example, who claims that there is another prophet after Muhammad, right? Like the Qadianis of India and Pakistan. They claim there is another prophet, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed. Those, though they may pray five times a day, they fast like we fast. You know, if they get, if they they change their names or passports and come and make Hajj, you know, they do all the things that we do, except that they believe that Mirza Ghulam Ahmed was a prophet. They are no longer Muslim. They are another religion. So, where people, in terms of 
either La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah either aspect of the declaration of faith where they have broken these then they are no longer Muslims they have formed another religion where people have given the attributes of Allah to his creation they have another religion where people have claimed there was another prophet after Muhammad they have another religion and when we go and look at the main body of the Shiites right, as a whole they represent about 10% of the total body of Muslims. Those in Iran, majority population in Iran, about 50%, 60% in Iraq, they're in Lebanon, Syria. These people, the Ithna Sharia, the Twelvers, they believe that the Imams have attributes which we believe only belong to Allah. They believe that the Imams are absolutely infallible. Meaning as they say that they can commit no errors either inwardly or outwardly, deliberately or inadvertently from their birth to their death. No errors. Absolutely. Free of error. As a Muslim we say absolute Infallibility belongs only to Allah. Even Prophet Muhammad as a Muslim we believe that he made some mistakes. He didn't commit errors of sin where he chose corruption over righteousness. No. But he did make errors of judgment in choosing what was good over what was better. And Allah corrected him in the Quran. Surah so, Anfal, after the Battle of Badr, when he decided what to do with the prisoners of, after the Battle of Badr, what to do with them, he asked the opinion of his companions. Abu Bakr said, They are our relatives. If we let them go, perhaps this will change, open their hearts, soften their hearts towards Islam, and they will become Muslims. Omar said, each one who has a relative amongst them should take that relative and kill him himself. Okay. Another companion, he said, put them in a valley and set the valley on fire. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, he heard the opinions, he was compassionate, soft, so he leaned to Abu Bakr's opinion. And he allowed them to ransom themselves, those who couldn't ransom themselves with money, they could teach ten Muslims to read and write, they let them go free and others who even didn't have this he let them go free then Allah corrected him in the Quran saying it was not befitting for the Prophet to take prisoners you know, ransom prisoners until he had established himself in the land why? because these people had just driven Muslims out tortured them, killed them taken their property, everything else for them to engage in a battle and you let them go as prisoners, they all feel Muslims are soft. You know, anytime we fight them, we'll get away. You know, we can always get away. If we don't win the battle or whatever, we can get away. And sure enough, they were back in Uhud. Same ones that were let free. They came back in the next battle of Uhud and were killing Muslims. So Allah's ruling was that no. In the beginning of the struggle like that, where Muslims have been driven out, tortured, etc., those prisoners of war should be executed to the last man. Execute them, finish. And they will think twice about coming against the Muslims. We have other incidents, Abbas wa Tawalla, you know, where Prophet was going to have a meeting with the leaders of Quraysh to give them some explanation of Islam. He knew that if these leaders accepted Islam, the people were like sheep. If the leader became Muslim, everybody else followed them automatically. So, this was a critical meeting. Then a blind man came to him, Ibn Umm Maktoum, came to him and said, teach me about Islam. He was very Muslim. He just wanted some teachings about Islam. The blind man, of course, difficult for him to learn, etc. He wanted to get something directly from the Prophet. So Prophet Muhammad he had a choice here. 
What appeared to him to be better, more critical, was dealing with the leaders of Quraysh. Dealing with Ibn Umm Maktoum was good. He's a Muslim, he's no good well, going anywhere. He's still going to be around after I've finished dealing with them. I can deal with them after. But Allah told him, you should have dealt with him. The believer takes priority. He's come and he's seeking the knowledge. He's a man who has submitted himself. He has right to you before these others. And in any case, when he went, he made the choice to go to the Quraysh leaders and he discussed with them. What did the Quraysh leaders say to him? Okay, Muhammad, we'll become Muslim. As long as you get rid of these low-class people, you know, that you have around you. We can't be sitting with them in the mosques and, you know, our next praying next to us, you know. Put them in the back. This was their, this was their arrangement. They wanted to, to have a special place. You know, and after you die, we're supposed to take over. We'll be the ones who take over after you. Of course, the Prophet ﷺ couldn't agree to these type of conditions. So they were left. And those same leaders ended up fighting against Muslims in Badr, in Uhud, in Khandaq, and so on and so forth. Dying disbelievers. So Allah corrected those choices of Prophet Muhammad where he chose what he thought to be better over what in fact was actually better. So these are not choices of evil. But still, it represents a mistake. A mistake that Prophet Muhammad was human. And Allah put those things in the Quran to let us know till the Yawm Al-Qiyamah that Prophet Muhammad was a human. So now, if the Prophet Muhammad made mistakes, can we say about anyone else that they are infallible? The infallibility of the Imam goes beyond the infallibility of the Pope. You know, the Christians, when the, the Pope, before he became a Pope, he was fallible. You know, he made mistakes. Right? And they even say that his infallibility is in religious matters. Because other areas he can make mistakes too. But in terms of religious matters, no, he's infallible, according to them. When he becomes the Pope. So even their claim of infallibility is less than that what the, the Shiites claim for the Imams. Furthermore, they claim that the Imams know the past, the present, and the future. That they are omniscient. They have knowledge of all things. This is in their books, writings. In my book, The Fundamentals of Tawheed, I quote the book, the page number, the writer, publication, everything where they are saying. This is not just rumor or speculation. This is what they teach. Khomeini in his book, al hukum al Islamiyah, the Islamic government, he writes that our Imams, the Imams, they have a station, a lofty station, not attained by any prophet sent or any angel among the close angels to God. And they have a creational caliphate which gives them control over the atoms of the universe. This is Khomeini writing. This is their belief. These are attributes which belong only to Allah. Only Allah has power over the atoms of creation. No human being has that. No human being knows the past, present and future. No human being is absolutely infallible. So, when they make these claims, <coughs> as I said, this puts them into another religion. It's no longer just a question of another sect, another madhab, or another you know, school of thought. No, this is another religion. And in fact, they make it clear in their own pillars of Iman. You know, they have pillars of faith. It says we have pillars of faith. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught us that this, there are six pillars of faith. If somebody, the six pillars of faith, belief in Allah, in His angels, in His books, in the messengers of Allah, right? In the day of resurrection, right? The resurrection and judgment. And in the destiny, the good and the evil of it. Now, if a person says, I believe in all five, but I don't believe in the destiny. I believe human beings have free will. They can do what they want to do. There's no destiny. Nothing is written. Is this person a Muslim? Hmm? He's not a Muslim. Because he has rejected one of the pillars of Iman. That's what the pillars of Iman means. You reject any one of these, you're out. You're out of Islam. Okay. They have their own pillars. Which include some of ours. And among them is belief in the Imamate. As they believe in it. So for them, 
anyone who rejects the belief in the imamate as they believe in it as 90% of the Muslim world reject that belief what is their ruling on them? going to hell so that's how they view us sure you'll hear the leaders saying there's no difference between Sunni and Shiite we're all the same one we're all the same then why are they making such a big effort to convert Sunni Muslims into Shiite? <laughs> you have to question yourself why if we're all the same why don't they go to non-Muslims and make them Shiite? but no what you see is they go directly to the Sunni Muslims people who are new Muslims who are ignorant or in communities where people are unaware of their beliefs and their practices places like Philippines, Sri Lanka you know places where they're not familiar with the Shiites and then they focus on the ignorant Sunni Muslims and try to convert them into Shiites so though they're saying on one hand we're all the same and all these different type of things in practice they're doing something else altogether this is the reality so we know that there is a hidden agenda though on one hand they are saying one thing the truth of the matter is something else they do not look at the mass of Muslims as being Muslims going to paradise and in fact due to their beliefs we have to consider them to be another religion they are not inside Islam among the Shiites you have a group called the Zaydis of Yemen now the Zaydis Though they're called Shiites, in fact, their beliefs are the same as ours. They're the same as ours. In terms, they don't hold these, you know, incredulous beliefs, which take them out of Islam. So they're considered, though they're classed in the general class category of Shiites, they are not considered to be belonging to another religion. They're the same, they belong to the same group as Ahlul Sunnah or Jama'ah. So, that is to say then, when we are going to look at Ahl Sunnah al Jama'ah, this term we said was coined to distinguish between those who had deviated from the way of the Prophet Muhammad and had chosen another path from those who had stayed on the path. Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. This is why when you pick up the books of the Shiites and you read it, they don't say the Prophet said this, the Prophet said that, the Prophet said. You see, they say the Imam said this. The Imam said that, and the Imam said the other. They don't quote the Prophet. So you see, the Sunnah is lost. The Sunnah is lost. This is why the, the main group of Muslims address, identify themselves as Ahl Sunnah. They follow the Sunnah. We practice according to what Prophet Muhammad told us, what he did, what he taught us. And the Jama'ah, the main community of believers, not splitting off from them. Now, in our times, Among those classified as Ahl Sunnah al Jama'ah, there arose people who started to give themselves some other names, like those who became known as the Mu'tazilites. This is a philosophical group which was under the influence of Greek philosophical thought, where they denied Allah's attributes, and in that way, though they are not amongst the Shiites, they were from Ahl Sunnah al Jama'ah, they have deviated. Similarly, you had others who then called themselves Sufis. Tasawwuf, Ahlul Tasawwuf, the Sufis. Such people then started to create for themselves another set of beliefs and practices. In fact, when you study the essence of their teachings, you find that they teach that human beings are fundamentally, the human soul is divine. The human soul is divine. This is the same teachings of the Hindus. The process of reincarnation is the reunification of the human soul with the universal soul, Brahman. This is the same belief. And this is what is taught in this. It's covered in philosophical talk, Greek philosophical talk, as well as Islamic terminology, you know. But the fact of the matter is, they have deviated from the main teachings of the Prophet ﷺ and the early generation of Muslims. So, what you find, what you found is that when these tendencies arose, you found scholars of that era, this is, you know, from the time of the Abbasids and onwards, starting to refer to 
following the Quran and Sunnah as it was understood and practiced by the Salaf. I use this term, the Salaf. Salaf being the early generations of pious Muslims. Those first three generations. They realized at that point it wasn't enough just to say I'm following the Quran and Sunnah because the Sufis were saying we're following Quran and Sunnah. The Mu'tazilites were saying we're following Quran and Sunnah. And other wings and deviations were making the same claim. So, in order to clarify what is meant by following the Quran and Sunnah, they added this additional clause. That we follow the Quran and Sunnah as it was understood and practiced by the first three generations of Muslims. And those who followed that same methodology. The companions of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, their students known as the Tabi'un, and their students, Atba' al-Tabi'in. This is the first three generations. So, their understanding, why? Because they were closest to the revelation. They best understood the intent and how that revelation should be practiced. Their understanding was given precedence over that which was taken at later times by other groups. So, what may be called Today, the Salafi movement, when a person says that I am a Salafi, what in fact he is saying is, I am following the Quran and Sunnah according to the understanding of the early generations of pious Muslims. Known as the Salaf. One who follows the way of the Salaf, linguistically in Arabic is termed a Salafi. However, what we find is that that understanding, which is really understanding of a principle, has been used by some people today to label a movement. So Salafi shifted from being an understanding to a movement. See, just as Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah didn't represent a particular movement, a particular organization which had a leader and followers and special scholars and all those type of things. No. It represented the understanding of the mass of Muslims. The Sunnah following the Sunnah, the way of the Prophet and sticking to the Jama'ah. Similarly, the concept of the Salaf, Salafiya, is that of following the Quran and the Sunnah as it was understood by the early and practiced by the early generation of Muslims. This does not represent a term which we can now put as a label on a movement that has an Amir and so on, so we say this is the Salafiya movement. No. There's no such thing as the Salafiya movement. Salafiya is an understanding. An understanding of Islam. One can say, yes, I follow the Quran and Sunnah according to the way of the Salaf. Yes, from that point of view you can say I'm a Salafi. But it doesn't represent a movement that I have a card that says Salafi. You know, and we have an organization, this is the leader of the Salafis. No, no. no. This, doesn't have to, this, is, this doesn't exist. So, when we are today looking at issues which are arising in the community, we should look at these issues when we're trying to resolve our problems, etc. We should look at them according to the Quran and the Sunnah. This is the methodology that we have to follow. First and foremost, the Quran and the Sunnah. We have a problem. Some people want to do this, and other people want to do that. Which is going to arise from time to time. We have differences of opinion. What is the best path to follow? How do we determine? We go back, as Allah tells us, فَرُدُّوهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ Take it back to Allah and His Messenger. This is the proper course of action. Now in terms of that application now, after we have found in the Quran and the Sunnah the solution, how do we apply it? Now we must look at the way that the early generations of Muslims understood it and applied it. And this is how we should approach its application. This is the correct way. It doesn't mean that we have no intellectual uh, contribution to make. 
because for sure what was understood and practiced then does not cover every single circumstance which will arise in our time we take their practice their methodology as an example as guidance and then we have now to look at our circumstance and see how do we resolve the problems which are unique to our time because we have some which arise which are unique to our time but we follow the methodology used by the generations before us this is the correct approach and this is the relationship between what may be called the Salafi or the Salafiyah or the Salafi approach and Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah actually it is one and the same the scholars in the earlier time used Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah to distinguish themselves from the Shia and later scholars after them used the term Salaf to distinguish within Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah from those who called themselves Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah but they had deviated into other philosophical movements like the Mortezilites or mystical movements like the Sufis etc etc inshallah that covers basically the topic which began looking at the goals of the Sharia the goals of the Sharia which identify a middle path for Muslims that we should avoid the extremes either to the left or to the right in our material world as well as in our spiritual endeavors we should avoid extremes this was the way of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم. he warned us against extremism with regards to himself elevating him beyond his status as those before had elevated the earlier prophets and deviated and he warned us in terms of our practice of the religion not to make the religion a burden on others though what we are doing may be righteous may be good but if we go to extremes with it then it can become a burden on others it can make others dislike the religion it can discourage non-Muslims from Islam by going to certain extremes this is why one of the du'as in the Quran you know we say we ask Allah not to make us fitnatan lil kafaru make us a fitna for those who disbelieve because we can, we can do it by going to extremes we can become a fitna for the disbelievers discouraging them from Islam So, Islam invites us to that state of moderation which is a state wherein the practice of Islam is easy. Not to the point where we neglect the fundamental practices of Islam and say we're taking it easy. No. The fundamental practices is what makes a Muslim. Anything less than that is not making it easy, is leaving Islam. Right? So we have to be careful when talk, people talk about taking it easy. Taking it easy don't mean praying one time a day instead of five. It's just, praying one time a day is leaving Islam. I know. So above the fundamental things, the voluntary acts, these are the ones that we take according to what we can handle. We don't overdo it. Try to take it in a moderate way. You know, and try to do it regularly because as Prophet Sallallahu said, this is what is most pleasing to Allah, that we do our voluntary acts regularly. Even though it's not many, it's a minor act, but we do it regularly, it is more beloved to Allah than that we do so much intermittently, only once in a while. And we can see from the practice of the companions of the Prophet, may God peace and blessed be upon him, that they also enjoying this state of moderation moderation which prevents a person from being so excessive that they neglect their responsibility to themselves their own health and to their families the families having a right on them that in our enthusiasm to want to do Islam to the utmost you know we can sometimes neglect our families and hurt them so we have to maintain that moderate path 
to fulfill our responsibilities as Islam has instructed and the division which has taken place amongst Muslims historically is one which was predicted by the Prophet it's important for us to know what is the path that he and his companions followed because that is the one path that ultimately will lead us back to paradise so it is our responsibility to find out what is the way of the Prophet ﷺ and his companions to live and practice our Islam according to their example and inshallah we will be among those who are a part of what is called the saved sect those who will remain upholding the path the correct path of the Prophet Muhammad and his companions until the last day. Inshallah, I will stop here now and give you all an opportunity <coughs> to raise any points of discussion that you would like with regarding this particular presentation. Can, uh, can we call the Jafari the Dawn the Ja'faris. Can we call the Ja'faris as non-Muslims? As I said... You see, they, they follow the same Quran. No, brother, uh, brother, hold on, hold on, please. Yes. You know, as I said already, the Ja'faris are the Isna Ashriya. They are one and the same. Okay? They are one and the same. They call themselves Ja'faris, meaning that they are following the Ja'fari Madhab, which is a bunch of sayings and practices attributed to Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq the truth of which is quite questionable in many cases but the problem doesn't lie in the fiqh the fiqh meaning you know whether you raise your hands in prayer or you don't raise your hands and you know all these other kinds of things this is not I mean though there are differences I mean major differences in some cases they permit for example anal intercourse it's not permitted for us. They permit muta, temporary marriage. You can, you know, arrange a marriage for one week, one day. You pay your mahar, the day is over, enough. We, main body of Muslims, don't accept this. Okay? But these are still issues of fiqh. We could say this is an error in fiqh and understanding and application of law. But the difference lies, where the difference lies, the fundamental difference, which leads us to say they are another religion, is in the aqidah itself in their concept of Allah and man this is on this basis that we say they are another religion because just as we have other groups we mentioned the Qadianis right the Qadianis who will pray as we pray they will fast as we fast they will give zakah as we give zakah you know even the, the, the Shias they have a different principle they have khumus and all this I don't know. the Qadianis they give the same zakah same calculation you know? Hajj we make Hajj but we consider them another religion those who say that Ghulam Mirza Ghulam Ahmed was a prophet as well as those who say he was a reformer because they split into two groups right yeah. the Ahmadis and the Qadianis but both were declared by the mass of the scholars of the Muslim Ummah to be non-Muslim Scholars of the past have already declared them. The leading scholars of the, the Muslim Ummah, you read the writings of Abu Hanifa, of uh, Imam Malik, you know, Imam Shafi, and others, they have already said it. It's already said. It is political circumstances today, you know, which, uh, you know, keep it sort of quiet political circumstances as far as the Alawis went the Shiites themselves declared them to be non-Muslims <laughs> you understand? the Shiites themselves classified them as Ghulatu Shia this is under that heading huh? the Isna Sharia the twelve verse Shiites they had declared the Nusairis after that and them to be non-Muslims they declared them as out it's only Khomeini who brought them back in Khomeini did you see when Khomeini took power and the Muslim world you know was 
you know, wow, Islamic State, you know, you know, have a law of Akbar, you had Muslims making bay'ah to Khomeini, he's our imam, and all this kind of thing. Muslims are very Muslim movement, you know, and Muslim, and others are doing this, right? Then, in Syria, the Ikhwan movement in Syria, right, came into conflict with the Nusairis. In Ham and Hama, there was an uprising. And the Nusairis turned their military might against them. The, the, the Ikhwan in Hamza and Hama, they called out to Khomeini, help us! And Khomeini declared his solidarity with Hafid Asad who earlier Shiites had all declared en masse to be a non-Muslim. He recognized them as Shiite brothers. It shows you what is, what is their intent. What is their true uh, view. Brother Rohan, I'm glad you... Yeah, hello, first went to, to and all the leaders from different groups who went to, to Iran and uh, the leaders of Iran and the uh, representatives from Iran went, they didn't receive them. A representative from Hafez Asad went and they received them. Also, when, when the Seattle first applied for, to open an office in, in um, Tehran. In Tehran, they refused. Because he was not, because he was not Same thing with the uh, Mujahideen in Afghanistan. Initially they had an office in, in Iran. But then when they found out the hidden agenda of the Shiites, they had to pull their office out. They had to pull their office out. They pulled their office out. I mean now, Buhan al-Din Rabbani, you know, for political, because he's been pushed out of position in, in Kabul, he's now gone and made overtures to them to try to get their backing to try to get, regain power. But initially during the jihad in Afghanistan, the Mujahideen did have office in, 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 in Iran, which they had to pull out because they found out the hidden agenda that they had trying to convert them to Shiaism and to promote the Shiite elements to the forefront. Who the Bukharas? The Bukharas. is a branch of the Ismaili Shiites. They're called the Dawoodi Shiites. They have the same belief that their Imam is God incarnate. Just they don't recognize Aga Khan, they have another God. <coughs> when you went to Iran, they gave you a full course, special tour. Eh? <laughs> That was, that was a special invitation by Khomeini. Actually, they were trying to... How can the religious do when they, when they, when they started to go for? You know, but you know, one thing that... Uh, I hope now that those Muslims who are among us, right, who, have, who seem to have a great sympathy to the, the Shia, right, to understand that basically, I mean, if you have anything for them is to give them down, to invite them to the to the correct path, you know, uh, we, we shouldn't really have no compromise with them. And even now, I hear brothers and even sisters talking about their relationship with those people who in the Bahamas here, who either profess to be Shia, associated with Shia, and they use all kind of little, little um, side terminology. And us among us who say, you know, well, you know, they they do the same thing we do. They say Salah like us. They do this like us. But you know, they're not really Shia. They just really we are making all the necessary um, excuses excuses to have that live connection with them, so that they can intermingle and be comfortable among us. And when they comfortable, they really come. Not, not, not that they give them any doubt. They just want to be comfortable among us, right? So you find, you find that even to the point they even question